Awesome. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Week two, we're going through the Biblical Finance Basics course. Um, last week, we got started talking about um, just kind of a foundational level on stewarding, um, primarily looking at the fact that our money, our things, our stuff, really everything in the world ultimately um, belongs to the Lord. It's his. He created it. He owns it. And you might remember the verse that three times said, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. All things belong to God. And that is the foundation that we certainly need to build off of um, in considering this. But then we looked at the fact that in the creation mandate, God takes all these things that he's created and that belong to him that are under his ownership and then um, declares to us that we shall have dominion over them. And so we are given from the order of creation, this task to steward the resources of the earth for God's glory and for the benefit of ourselves and our families and that sort of thing. And so that really is where financial management or stewardship, the foundation in which it comes from. We believe it's all from God and it's all ultimately for him. No, you can take that. <laughs> um, unless I need it, then I'll, I'll ask you for it. But, <laughs> um, the, that's where we started. And then this week, um, we're still kind of doing an introductory one. So it's not jumping straight in. Typically, when you talk about a biblical finance one, people think week one, it, you jump like straight into budgeting, right? That's where people's mind goes. But there's a lot of fundamental truths that we have to believe in the word and understandings about what the word teaches about these things um, in order to really navigate these things rightly. And this week, we're going to talk about blessing and cursing as it relates to money. And the Bible actually talks a ton about finances, wealth, possessions, these sorts of things being a blessing um, from God, as well as how these financial things, these material things of the world can also be a curse, whether that's these physical things being removed from us as a curse or these things in their wrong place in our life function as a curse rather than a blessing. And so it's really important that we grasp kind of this foundational level of blessings and curses before um, we move into more um, management of money, so to speak. So next week we'll get into how to earn or acquire money. Um, the Bible teaches far more on this than most people realize. Um, there's tons of teaching on that. So we'll spend a good amount of time in that and then we'll get into what most of us do with money and that's spending money for the remainder of the weeks in this because that's a huge part of the stewardship part so let's jump in with some prayer and we'll get right in dear Heavenly father we thank you so much for allowing us to come back um, to your house to worship you um, with the assembled saints this lord's day and god we're just so thankful for one another that you have not placed us to live this christian walk um, in isolation, but you've placed us in community, in a family, that we can learn and grow in these things with one another. And God, I pray that as we study a really important topic of finances, and particularly um, the blessings and cursings of finances, um, that we would be really governed and think and have our heart's affections driven by what your word teaches. And Lord, we know that there's so many snares and traps when it comes to these things. And Lord, I pray that we would not only think rightly, but um, have our affections governed rightly as it pertains to these matters. And so, Lord, would you be with us in this time? Would this time be profitable and fruitful? Um, and Lord, would it be all to your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so looking at your handout, we got basically seven points to work through and not a ton of time. And so we're going to be at a fairly aggressive pace this morning. Um, and I will try to keep us on, on track the best I can. Uh, but I will need your help. So like I said, week one, there will be times where I ask people to read Bible verses. Um, and as well, because some of these might run close to the end of our time, feel free to interject with questions. I'd rather miss a bullet point here or there and actually have discussion. If I make a point that you're like, what in the world is that about? Raise your hand. Let's talk about it. Okay, so this, this can be interactive. It doesn't just need to be me up here talking, all right? But to jump in as we consider blessings and cursings with money in the scriptures, it's important to point out right at the very front end, I think, two prominent errors in the church, because these are what instantly come to mind when you talk about finance and material possessions being a blessing from God. The first thing I think most Christians are going to be worried about is, is this about to turn into the prosperity gospel? Are you saying that if I like sow a seed of 
faith, pray a prayer. If I just believe hard enough that God will make me rich. Well, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's heresy, and it turns God into basically just this cosmic vending machine. I put in the right spiritual tokens, and he will give me um, wealth and financial prosperity um, that God just exists basically to meet my needs. And the, the greatest sin it commits is not only perverting a lot of the Scripture's teachings on this regards, but also it almost inevitably ends up worshiping and serving the created thing rather than the Creator. God is merely a means or an avenue to get our wealth, not the end in and of itself. And so certainly we must be very weary of the prosperity gospel. This is the type of thing that's pushed on people all over um, the televangelist sort of preachers. You know, you, you need a healing, you need more wealth, just send in some money and we'll, we'll send that your way. Um, that sort of thing is wicked in God's sight and must be rejected. But as much as there's the air of the prosperity gospel, I think often in conservative churches, we deal with that um, pretty well. I think most conservative pastors have been pretty good at preaching against the prosperity gospel. There's also a more subversive um, type of poverty gospel that basically the more poor you are, the more righteous you are. This idea that and there was kind of books that were very popularized, at least uh, when we were teenagers coming up, things like um, Radical or Crazy Love, some of these books. And reading them, you just kind of got this impression, unless I have given every material possession I own to the poor, I'm a terrible Christian. Okay, And it can kind of like put this burden on you that unless you are just giving every ounce and have absolutely nothing left for yourself, then you're really not a genuine believer. And the scriptures don't talk about money that way either. Um, that, that is a, a false um, gospel in and of itself too, because it sees righteousness and salvation as coming through your giving away of all your money rather than in Christ and Christ alone and the merits of his gift um, to us. And so both of those things we've got to reject on the front end as we come into this. And as well, just by way of introduction, I think it's helpful for us to think as we think in categories of money, is there actually being like four financial statuses? And I got this from a teaching um, from Douglas Wilson on a topic. He made this point. I thought it was really interesting that in our mindset and in our culture, we tend to think of really just two categories when it comes to finances. We tend to think of the haves and the have-nots, those who are wealthy and those who are poor, right? We think of just two categories, those who have it and those who don't. But as Christians, really, we should think more in lines of four categories, and really there's various shades in all of these, you know, but just as a general way of thinking about it, we should think about the fact that there are righteous people who have wealth, and there's wicked people that have wealth. There's righteous people who are poor, and there's wicked people that are poor. There's no actual personal virtue in either financial status. You're not necessarily righteous because you're poor or rich, and you're not necessarily wicked because you're poor or rich. Rather, we see throughout the scriptures that both things can be true and are true in a number of different circumstances. So that's helpful for us to remember as we're talking about blessings and cursings as it pertains to wealth and finances. We can't think just in those two narrow categories, like if I get a lot of money, then God's happy with me. If I have a little money, then God's angry at me. Or if I have a little money, God's happy with me. And if I have a lot of money, God's angry at me. Okay, that, that category doesn't work. It's too simplistic. Um, there's shades within both of those for righteousness and wickedness. Okay, so we wanted to kind of lay all those things out in the introduction um, just by way to hopefully clarify the stage of we're not talking about the prosperity gospel. We're not talking about the poverty gospel. We understand that there's a whole spectrum of these things um, and we have to put all of them in their order. And so in order to put those in their order, the second point you'll see on your handout, and this is where we'll spend a lot of our time just in the Bible, is looking at better blessings. So one of the things we see and talk about a lot in the church is that the Christian life is a well-ordered life. Okay, it puts things in its right places. Not all things are the same. And so say something is a blessing from God, does that mean all blessings are equal? No, some blessings are actually better than other blessings. Is it a blessing if you get an ice cream cone? Yeah, it's a blessing if you get an ice cream cone. Is that a better or worse blessing than getting a baby? 
Okay, right? No, the baby is obviously a greater, more significant blessing than that ice cream cone is. And one of the things you see throughout Proverbs, which we're going to lean on, probably is the most prominent book for this study because it talks so much about finances, is that time and time again, as it relates to wealth, it says certain blessings are better than financial prosperity. And so we need to understand all the things that are more important than wealth as it pertains to the blessing God gives. And the first of those is wisdom. So could someone read for us from Proverbs chapter 3 verses 13 through 15? Absolutely. So that this blessing of wisdom, it's better than gold, better than the profit of gold, better than precious jewels. Um, nothing you desire can compare with her, right? So wisdom is a better blessing than riches. We also see that in Proverbs 8, um, 10 and 11. Can someone read that one for us? Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels. All that you may desire cannot compare with her. Absolutely. Someone jump in with 1616 of Proverbs as well. How much better is your wisdom and gold if you get understanding? Absolutely. So three times we see in the Proverbs it says it's better to have wisdom than to have gold. So if you're in the marketplace of blessings and two things are on the shelf, one is wisdom and one is gold, what's better? Take the wisdom, right, is what's clearly laid out for us. It also says in Ecclesiastes um, chapter 4, verse 13, it says, Better a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. All right? So it's better to be that young, poor guy who's wise than the old guy with lots of riches who is foolish, okay? So that is the clear teaching of scripture, but that is certainly not limited to wisdom. It's also true of fear of the Lord. Can someone read for us Proverbs 15, 16? Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Yeah. So if you can choose between a lot of treasure or fear of the Lord, what do you pick? Fear of the Lord, right? has to be a priority over that. It's a better blessing than riches are. What about love? Someone, um, the very next verse, Proverbs 15, 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fat and awesome tasted with it. Yeah, amen. So who here would be excited about a dinner of herbs tonight? Okay, that sounds like not a great meal, right? I'm, I'm someone who particularly enjoys meat and potatoes, okay? A dinner of herbs doesn't sound very satisfying, but would you rather have a feast where everyone is angry at each other or a salad for dinner where everyone loves each other, right? That's an easy choice. And if you've ever been to a contentious Thanksgiving meal, you know that. All right. Maybe some of you had a mother who growing up as she was preparing the meal was stressed out of her mind and yelling at everyone and everyone was trying to run from the kitchen to stay away from her because she was just in a frenzy and then the meal is served and everyone pretends like they're having a good time because now the guests are over. Right. But that's not a picture of a great feast. Right. If you're going to enjoy a great feast, you want to be where love is. Right. And certainly that is the case um, when it pertains to wealth as well. Uh, we would rather have love um, than we would to have great material possessions. This is also true of righteousness. Someone read for us Proverbs 16, 8. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Hmm. Amen. So better to have righteousness than to have great material possessions as well. What about humility in the next verse, uh, Proverbs 16, 19? Or not next verse, but same chapter. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Yeah. Better to be lowly in spirit with the oppressed or with the poor, depending on your translation, than to divide the spoil with the proud, right? So it's better... Better to be humble than to have great material possessions. What about peace? Someone read for us Proverbs 17.1. Better is a little with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. 
Better is a dry morsel and quietness with it than a house full of feasting with strife. Yep. Strife is worse than having just a dry morsel for dinner, right? And all this obviously goes along with material prosperity. Peace is more important. And then again into integrity. Could someone read for us Proverbs 19.1? Better is a poor person who walks in his integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. Yep. And then someone 28.6 for us. Better is poor who walks in his integrity than he is perfect going to be rich. Yep. So integrity is more important than the blessing of finances. How do you think that pertains if you're running a business for yourself, right? Is it easy to cut corners to make more money sometimes? Sure. You, you can totally defraud people and um, dishonor your word in order to make a little more money. But what does the scriptures teach us? That it's better to have your integrity than to have more money, which leads to the next one of honesty, certainly related to this idea of integrity. Someone read for us Proverbs 19.22. What a person desires is unpleasant love, better to be poor than a liar. It's better to be a poor man than a liar, right? So certainly our honesty, our integrity is more important. That's a better blessing than to have material possessions. And then finally, we'll look at the last one. A good name is more important than to have great um, wealth. Someone read for us Proverbs 22.1. And then a very similar um, verse in Ecclesiastes 7, 1, it says, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death better than the day of birth. But the first half of that really is the focus. A good name is better than precious ointment, right? A good name is more important than material possessions or wealth. So why go through all of that? I probably missed some. This is just through like a quick flipping through Proverbs to see all the different betters that pop up. Because that's one of the fascinating things as you look through Proverbs. It doesn't merely just impart wisdom, but it helps order things. It says certain things are better than other things and helps us to align ourselves with that, those better things as you work through Proverbs. And time and time again, it makes all these different points of these different attributes or gifts from God that are better than material possessions. Because when we start talking about financial prosperity being a blessing, our sinful hearts can have a tendency to think of this as the chief blessing. How do I know if I'm blessed? By how much I have in the bank. And God doesn't think that way. We can acknowledge that financial things and material possessions are a blessing, but we have to understand in God's economy, in his order of things, it is not nearly at the top of the list. Okay, just flipping through Proverbs, we see that you can be someone who's abundantly blessed by the Lord um, and not have material blessings if you have all these other things, right? And actually, you would be far better off than someone who had material possessions but did not have those things. So it's really important that in acknowledging that we do believe that physical things and tangible things can be a blessing from God, they're not the ultimate blessing from God. And God's word goes um, into great detail to teach us that it is not the most important blessing. And actually, when we put it in its wrong order, when we don't use it rightly, it can become a curse unto us, which leads to the third point we'll get into, the curse of unguarded affections. Someone with your Bible still closed, maybe, what can you... Can someone tell us off the top of your head what the Tenth Commandment is? You shall not covet. Yep. And the full length of it is you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, with the exception of the wife there, what are all those things? Material possessions, right? You shall not covet other people's stuff, right? So if your heart is wrong in the pursuit or desire of things, if you have a very consumeristic, unappreciative mindset that just wants more things, 
Um, that will be a curse to you. It's a breaking of God's law. It's certainly not a blessing to have this desire for things that are not yours but belong to other people. Being jealous is not a virtue um, in the scriptures. And then a very common verse as it relates to money, it's often misquoted but still important, is 1 Timothy 6.10. Can someone read that one for us? For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Yeah. So often this is misquoting as saying that money is the root of all evil. That's not what it says. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. In other words, what it's saying is when your affections are inappropriately um, drawn to money, rather than the things that are more important than money, then it will lead to all kinds of other sins. It, will, it says through this craving, you think of your stomach desiring things that are not um, righteous, it's through this craving that some have wandered away even from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs, all right? If our affections are not rightly ordered as it pertains to money, if we love it in an inordinate or improper way, it can lead to all kinds of evil. So. All of this may sound well and good, and most of you probably intellectually agree with all these things, right? If you were to take a pop quiz um, and you were to say, what is better, honesty or money, right? I think everyone would check the right answer of that, integrity or money. We check the right answer of that. If it came to even the bad things, should you covet? Most people would say no, right? If we were just filling out a, a check sort of quiz, most of us would get this right but the reality is as you really consider your own life um, what has been the fruit of that knowledge in your life as it pertains to money do you really treasure wisdom more than it uh, are you living that way do you really treasure your integrity more than that is that how you are governing yourself in your business affairs do you really treasure um, care and love for other people in your home when money's tight, does it lead to more bickering? Or do you still maintain your joy, right? Now, all these things rise to the surface um, as we deal with money. What about um, covetousness? How often are you upset by the things that you don't need but really want? Or how often do you spend more than you've made putting yourself into a lot of trouble to buy things that you want but don't need, right? We, we do these sorts of things. as. Americans, most of us are swimming in different forms of debt because we paid for things that we didn't have the money for and didn't need often. It's just racking up vacations on credit cards or these sorts of things. They're completely extras, but we've given ourselves to them. So we have to really ask ourselves, are we living like these things are true? Or do we merely believe um, that they're true? If you acquire more wealth in this life, say you apply these things we're talking about, and find yourself to be doing very well financially, you have a lot in your bank account, but you do not um, understand how your affections are to be governed towards your wealth, it will be a curse upon your family, not a blessing. So we have to understand that from the very beginning. How we engage with money and putting it in its right place, so to speak, in our life is foundational for us using it rightly. So let's keep moving now into common grace blessing. So with this foundation laid of understanding that how we think about wealth and the blessing of wealth has to be rightly ordered with our, within our life, um, we have to understand as well that all financial prosperity, again, going back to last week, does ultimately come from God. And this is irrespective of whether someone is righteous or wicked. We have to understand that God is the giver of good things. He is the one that provides all material possessions, whether they're a follower of him or not. Um, listen to what it says in Matthew um, 5.45, and then I'll ask someone else to read from James 1.17, if they could flip over there. But in Matthew 5.45, it says, For the love of money is root of all kinds of evil. Oh, dang it. I copied the verse reference there from the last one. Someone else give me Matthew 5.45. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, for he makes his son 
eyes on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Yeah. So he sends his rain on the just and the unjust. Does he provide roofs over the houses of unjust people? Yeah. Does he put food on their table? Yeah. It still comes from him. We have to acknowledge that these things come from God, whether we're righteous or unrighteous. That is certainly true. And then James 1.17. Someone help me with that one. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, for whom there is no variation, but no shift in the shadow. Let me tell you, to ask you, do people who don't follow the Lord, do they still enjoy good things in this life? Yeah. Of course they do. And what's the source of that? It's God. That's one of the reasons they have a duty to worship him. Because he is giving them good things, and thus that's why they are held accountable, even if they've never heard the name Jesus. We see from Romans 1, all people are without excuse. He gives good gifts to all people. And we have to understand that from the foundation, that common grace blessing that's completely um, devoid of whether or not um, someone is a righteous person, because God is a gracious God. He doesn't give us what we deserve that was the case, none of us would be in this room. We'd all be in hell at this very moment if we all got exactly what we deserve. But God gives good gifts to all men, and that certainly includes even those that are not following him. But we also see in the scriptures that there are blessings and curses that come from following him or not following him. So he does give common grace, but there is also particular blessings and curses that come depending on whether a people are following him or not. And to begin, we have to see that from a national level as we see play out in the scriptures, not just an individual level. When you think of finances, most of us immediately think to our household finances, but God always thinks on all the layers, right? He thinks of corporate entities, he thinks of bodies, he thinks of families, he thinks of churches, and he thinks of individuals, right? He thinks of all those layers. And listen to what it says in Genesis 12, as um, the great um, covenant was being made to Abram at this time, the promise to him. It says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And then notice what it says in verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now we know that this promise was ultimately found its fulfillment in Christ, that one that came from Abraham, Abraham's seed would come and that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But in this we see not only a promise that God would prosper Abraham's offspring, the people of Israel, and that included certainly material blessings, but also that there's a promise to the surrounding nations as well, right? If they are treating you right, it will go well for them. If they're treating you wrong, it will go poorly for them. And I think there is an application to this in light of the new covenant, not in the exact same way, but nations that seek to honor God, it tends to go well for them. And nations that seek to dishonor God, it tends to go very poorly for them as the course of human history goes. Again, we have to zoom out often to see how these things work. But strident rebellion against God is never a good long-term strategy for a nation's wealth. Okay? I know that should, shouldn't be a shocker. But it, it's true. If we fought, live in God's world according to God's rules... It will go well for us, and that's true personally, but also it's true nationally. If we rebel against him, there are consequences to that. You see that fleshed out in Deuteronomy 28, right as the people have been wandering through the wilderness, they're getting ready to cross over the Jordan into the promised land, and there's this whole chapter detailing the blessings and the cursings, if they will be covenantally faithful unto their God who is now delivering them into the promised land, all this prosperity would come unto them, and if they would reject him, it was going to go really poorly for them. And we saw that play out in the life of Israel, did we not? Even when their meager attempts to follow God were there and their kings were doing even just modest efforts to lead the people in righteousness, God's hand of favor was upon them. But when they would run off into idolatry and forsake him, it went very poorly for them. It would lead to things like their exile. Okay, so that played out in the Old Testament. And then someone for us read um, Psalm 107, verse 33 through 38 as well, that I think we have to recognize as God's hand over the nations as it pertains to these things. He 
He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. Yeah. Is that right? Yep, that's it. So in that we see that God is blessing prosperity upon a righteous people, and he's bringing about judgment on an unrighteous people within that. Now, in, in saying this, I think this should function as a warning to us even in our own country, particularly because we've been given so much light of the gospel. The Bible has been so readily available and so accessible to us as a nation. Um, and we continue to rebel against it in so many wicked ways, the most grievous of which certainly is the slaughter of so many of our own children. Um, and we can tend to think that we're just entitled to God's hand of favor upon us. Um, I don't think it's wise for us to think that way. And particularly as we think about managing our own household finances, we should understand that culturally, we're not a culture that's been very favorable towards God and following him. And that if things, consequences come from that financially in the world and the nation around us, that shouldn't come as a surprise to us. Additionally, that should govern how we think about the solution. Is the solution hiring someone into office or electing someone into office that will just give us good tax cuts? Not really. Now, would we all be glad for tax cuts? I think we'd all say yes and amen, right? We would all love to pay less taxes, but the solution is ultimately repentance and revival. If we want God's hand of favor upon us, it's not merely about getting the right policy. It's about getting right before him. And I certainly think we need to be considering that as a nation as it pertains to these sorts of things. And as well, we just need to be honest about the fact of the way our culture is and set up our family Likewise, we shouldn't expect that things are just always going to go well um, prosperity-wise in a nation that's in rebellion against God. And we should do our best to insulate our own walls, so to speak, from that um, and be as ready as we can to help our family get through potentially hard times financially uh, when we look at the spiritual landscape of things around us. All right, so we've looked at the national blessings, the common grace blessings, but what do we tend to all think about when we think about finance? We think about our own personal blessings or curses. What's going on in my own bank account tends to be what we think about with this regard. And blessings and cursings are not solely national in the scriptures. They are also personal. Now, a huge aspect that we're going to see as we go through the rest of this study is a lot of what happens as it pertains to blessings or cursings with money has to do with your wisdom and how you acquire it and how you spend it. Okay. So we're going to get into all of that. The Proverbs say a lot about diligence and work that leads to prosperity. But particularly in this section, I want to just focus on our right standing before God or our opposition towards God and the implications that can have on finances that we see in the scripture. All right. So that we're going to say a lot more about this. Um, particularly as it pertains to righteous living and the fruit that can come from righteous living. Uh, but I want to just pick a few general verses for us to consider kind of as we're wrapping up um, this lesson. The first is from Proverbs 3.33. Could someone read that one for us? So there we see... The Lord in general is cursing the house of the wicked and he is blessing the house of the just or the righteous. What about um, Proverbs 10, 3? Could someone read that one for us? The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. Yeah. And then in that same chapter, someone read for us um, 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow. I love that verse because notice what it's talking about. For the righteous who prosper, he adds no sorrow to it, right? It's a good gift from him and can be received as such. But let me ask you, if you acquire wealth in an unjust way, are you going to be able to enjoy that wealth with no sorrow? No, it's going to be accompanied with grief and guilt and all kinds of other things. But when it's obtained in a righteous way, 
you receive it as a good blessing. You praise the Lord for it um, and receive it as such. And then one more verse for us to look at here. I, I told you we were going to be looking at a lot this morning, but 22.4 of Proverbs. Yep. It's wages, the wage of humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. All right. So the Bible says a lot about following God, being righteous and obedient to him, leading to a prosper or prosperous life, whereas being um, not following him leads generally towards um, being under his curse. Now, again, we, we remember all the foundation stones we laid here, right? This is not ultimate, it's not primary, it's not the only blessing, but we do have a father who delights in giving good gifts to his children. And a lot of times the reason why we don't see the financial blessing that God has given us is because we're filled with covetousness and greed. So we're comparing the blessings that God has given us to other people, and thus by comparison we'll, we will say, well, I certainly I must be under the curse of the Lord. Look at how little I have, right? But that's not the way the righteous thinks about money, is it? They look at the good gifts God has provided them and they praise him for it, that their needs are met and they praise him for it, right? That they do not go without lack and they praise him for it. So I think part of this is one of the reasons we fail to understand the blessing of material possessions that God provides is because we're looking at them through a sinful lens and judging them based on unbiblical means. But when we see it through the perspective of not um, having a love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil and not through the lens of covetousness, which is a great sin, but through the lens of God giving good gifts to his children, we'll realize that the possessions he does provide us are just that. They are a blessing. We also leave that not following him leads to all kinds of ruin, not just spiritually, but Physically, tangibly, in real life, not following God does have real consequences, um, and that those consequences can certainly affect our material possessions. Certainly, you just think of this in a number of ways, but it, if you're living the lifestyle of someone who's addicted, right, you waste a decent amount of money on that, do you not? Right? There's just natural consequences to these sorts of things. A lifestyle that's not honoring to the Lord leads to less money. And it, have you noticed what happens so often with people who win the lottery? Have you ever read on this or studied this? People that are addicted to gambling buy lottery tickets all the time and then finally win and they get like tens of millions of dollars. It's something like 70% of them end up bankrupt or something. So even that you might say, well, look, the wicked, they, they got all this money. Long term, they generally don't. And even a lot of these like vain sports athletes and stuff, a ton of them end up bankrupt even though they're making millions of dollars, in the long term of strategy of things, wickedness does not tend to prosper, whereas righteousness does um, what we see in the scripture. So a few things in conclusion, um, we must see in a proverbial sense that there is blessings and curses of physical possessions as it pertains to following the Lord or being in rebellion against him. That is not exclusively true. Uh, but as an overarching truth, we should see that, that living in God's world by God's rules tends to go well. Living in God's world in rebellion to God does not tend to go well as a general truth in this life. And with that, we do see some biblical exceptions, which is what everyone instantly tries to run to in these teachings. They say, but what about, right? What about Job, right? He was righteous. And a follower of God, he had a lot of material possessions, and it was literally because of his righteousness and following God that he ends up in this scenario where so much was taken away from him, right? Or another example, not just Job, but certainly if you're going to pick biblical examples, who should we look to? But Jesus, right? Was, has there ever been a more righteous man than Jesus that walked the face of the earth? Of course not. But yet he was not wealthy by any stretch. In fact, the Son of Man had no place to even to lay his head. He is, um, in many ways, homeless for a good part of his life. So you, we could look at those examples and, and say, certainly, there are biblical exceptions. If someone was in poverty, they shouldn't look at that and say, this must be because I've sinned greatly against the Lord, okay? That would be a wrong conclusion to draw. But if you notice on your handout, I say sort of. 
okay? So let's, let's look at Jesus, for example. What, did he have times where he was poor here on this earth? Yes, he did. But what was his reward for that? An inheritance of nations, okay? I think he did pretty well in that exchange. And what does it say in the Sermon of the Mount? Blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Inherit the earth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what, what about Job, right? He was faithful, and we actually saw God restore his fortunes in his own life. So sometimes it's just a season. Sometimes we think we, we can be so narrowly minded and think, oh, I'm just in the pit of despair right now and not realize that that's a season of hardship that the Lord will deliver us from in time. And all of us, if we have an internal perspective, know that God is going to bless us richly for our lifestyles of faithfulness in this life. Maybe not in this life, but certainly in the one to come. Prosperity does follow faithfulness. We can say that as Christians. It might not be in this life. It might not be in the terms in which you wish them to be, especially if you're comparing yourself to others. But it is a truth from God's word that we need to rightly understand, all right? So we don't want to go in the prosperity gospel ditch. We also don't want to go in the poverty gospel ditch. We want to see these things as flowing from the hand of our sovereign God um, and order our affections rightly. The biggest thing I hope you take away from this is how you engage with money in your heart, in your spirit, in your mind is the foundational aspect of whether it will lead to blessing or curse for you. If you order it rightly amongst other things, it can be a great source of blessing. And if you make it an idol, it will certainly be a curse to you. Again, I'll use that illustration of the wicked person that receives lots of money, right? Let's say it's a drug addict who's given $5,000 cash. That could be what kills them, right? They might go and overdose that very night. Whereas when a righteous person receives that, it could very much be a source of their blessing, something that they are able to bless their family and others with, right? The money is important, but how you interact with that money and who you are matters far more than that. So let's pray and, and wrap up this week's lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much um, for our time, Lord. I thank you so much for the wealth of scriptures that we have in the word that teach us on these things. Even as we are going through the Proverbs, there was a bunch that we left out um, just because you teach us so much on this. And God, I pray that we would not merely manage our money um, rightly as it pertains to our, how we organize the monthly budget um, and balance it. But Lord, I pray that we would manage our money right as it pertains to our affections and our loves that you would help us to love the things that you love, to hate the things you hate, and to put things in their right place in our life. That we would never be more concerned about money than we would be about the greater virtues of the Christian life, but also that we wouldn't despise material blessings and thus despise the good gifts that you give us, but we would just put them in their right place, and thus we can use them in such a way that they're honoring to you. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful, you'd help us to follow you with all that we have, and it'd be all to your honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I think that's basically all we got. We went live.